Thank you very much. First of all, allow me to welcome you all here this evening. We appreciate your presence. Most of you would wonder why we chose this topic. And would it not be much of the same? Would it not be the PPP being in office, practicing a whole series of corrupt acts, and now, since they're out of office, coming here to criticize APNU when they do not have the moral authority to do so. Many people may ask that question. In fact, our fiercest critics have been saying this. And they're saying this largely, maybe with some justification in their own head, because they have work assiduously over the years to create a, a perception, a view of the PVP that we had grown to become a corrupt organism, that we had departed from Chedi Jagan's legacy, and that somehow all that mattered for the PPP in office was no longer the development of the country, but people scrambling to fill their own pockets. And so this view has been repeated and has come to, to, to characterize many of our leaders over time. It's actively peddled. So a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, I was asked by the Kaicho News a question on privatization. And I said to them at that time that long before the next elections are held, we will dismantle that perception. Because I think people today, having witnessed this government and the iniquitous behavior of this government in such a short period, that they are prepared now to listen. And that's all we ask that you listen with an open mind, not clouded by the propaganda of the past, not clouded by that tainted perception of people who were hostile to us and so everything that they did could not, often was not the reality, but was contrived, was designed for a political purpose. So we are asking, we think people are in the mood to listen now to our explanations. Explanations that we often gave when we were in government, but fell on deaf ears because they were drowned out by the clamor and the pylon of several of the newspapers who were hostile to us, the media resources, and opposite, opposition. So today, I just, that's all we require from you, to listen. And as Na Nandalal said, we will have several seminars where we will take a single project at a time. And we'll put it up and spend 30 minutes on the project as to how it was tendered, who did the evaluation, the award of the contract, why the decisions were made to award the contract in a particular way, and then allow people to ask questions of us so they can, in their own heads after, decide whether we had gone through a fair process. So this afternoon, I want you to examine comparatively the periods that we had been in office. Abnu 
was in office for 28 years in the post-independence era. And in 1992, we took office. What people have not paid attention to is the ch are, the, are the changes we made to the financial or the accountability architecture of Guyana. Because you can talk about individual acts of corruption, but if a country does not fix the framework within which public resources are collected and expended, then you cannot have sustainable, a sustainable battle against corruption. And so, here are just a few of the architectural changes we made in Guyana in terms of public accountability. We introduced program budgeting. Critical, we don't get credit for it, but it means that Every cent in a program budgeting scenario has to be accounted for. We automated the accounting functions and the treasury functions in the Ministry of Finance. Now, we heard from Kaicho News and the others that of the seven modules we had in the IFMA system, one was not activated. What they didn't say is that we introduce IFMAS and we activated all our, our six of the seven models, uh, modules and we had, we had difficulties in activating the, seven, the, the last one. But it was introduced, uh, uh, automating the functions. Nandalal spoke about the several features, the constitutional changes that we made to create an independent audit office. The reporting relationship changed from that through the Minister of Finance to the Parliament, to, um, that's how the audit office operated pre new, the new constitution, and then the, when we passed the new constitution, we made them report directly to the, the Parliament. The revenue authority itself was another feature that we introduced. Now, many people don't know the reasoning why, but you recall the days, in the early days, when we found someone corrupt at customs, we caught someone red-handed. Yesterday, Asgar and I were talking about it. I'm glad he's here. And we caught several customs officers who were stealing, and we wrote the Public Service Commission, trying to get them just suspended and we, six months would pass, and the Public Service Commission will not even suspend the people when, and, and they're caught red-handed. And so you had to ensure that you had greater accountability in revenue collection. You had to make that agency semi-autonomous, reporting to a board. And, and literally 30, 40 people were fired, caught, hired, and, and they had more ma control over the staff at that time. The Integrity Commission Act was, was brought into force under us. We then had the privatization white paper. I've just listed seven of the things, seven new features that by themselves don't seem a lot, but when combined will significantly modernize the architecture of public accountability and how we collected resources, how we expended resources, and how we disposed of resources, public resources. But when you combine all of these, the architecture of accountability, public accountability, with the changes that we made in modernizing the financial architecture of the country, which was separate to that of the architecture of accountability, you will see how much we have changed the country because we move from public the government accountability to public accountability so we introduced a new companies act which brought more democracy and greater rights to, to shareholders because so it was broadening accountability 
We introduce new insurance legislation. We pass new legislation to govern the stock exchange. We brought in the Financial Institutions Act to better regulate the, the banking system to make people's savings better. We put in, uh, we brought a new central act, um, government act, uh, the Central Bank Act into being, and we prohibited the central bank from financing the fiscal deficit. We put in a clause there so that if government could not raise revenue by, by um, uh, could not finance its activity by revenue or by loans, then it just had to cut the expenditure because the central bank could not print money and, uh, uh, for, for that purpose. We, we then inter we passed the anti-money laundering bill. I can list about 10 others. The point I'm making, none of these things we've gotten credit for. And so earlier this week or last week I was abroad and I saw Edge Hill's letter to the Starbuck News saying, how is it that you're giving credit to APNU for putting in the bid protest committee? And you can't give us credit for passing comprehensive procurement law, which the country never had pre-1992, comprehensive procurement law. I know that because I, I went to Washington. I got the best technical people to work on that law. It's one of the most modern pieces of legislation. If you disaggregate it and see the features there, you'd see that many developed countries can't match, don't have that sort of framework for public procurement. But how come we can't get the credit for that? Perhaps putting new law in place when in the 28 years under the PNC, they never had a procurement, procurement law. All the procurement that took place in 28 years were done under a, a, an SD letter and four pages of regulations. No law. And they don't dispute this. And so how come we don't get the credit for that? How come we don't get the credit for taking the cabinet out of the award of contracts? How come we don't get credit for giving contractors the right of appeal? You're, you're giving them now credit for appointing something, a, a, a feature, or activating a feature under the law that we passed, that we had activated in the past. They forget it too. So, this is the, the, reali the reality. My point is that people never listen sometimes. And so, the first thing is the People's Progressive Party comparatively change the entire framework of accountability. Let me give you an example of what the results of it. The international community only gave Guyana the project support. They were very reluctant in the early days, balance of pay, they would give balance of payment support, project support, and when they gave budgetary support, they made sure that it was for debt servicing, etc. Countries that have made sustained improvement in their accountability then were the only ones were, that were given budget support rather than project support because it meant they were satisfied that you were spending the resources well. And the European Union moved from project support to budgetary support. We won a few countries because of these changes to our procurement system. And do not underestimate what Nandelal said about the, the audit report. If, even if there are acts of corruption in that audit report, who allowed the audit report to be done? APNU could have allowed it. T 10 years of not allowing the report, that was a tool for us because it's not an indictment of the PPP that the audit report showed corruption. It's a, it is a tool because we allow the Auditor General to function so that he could expose the corruption and take it to the Parliament. It was a tool that was unavailable in the past. So that's the first point I wish to make about architecture. The second point about dismantling things, 
we must start systematically, and, we, and as Nandala said, we will do so. But let's take a few that are most egregious, that have been most prominent in the campaign against us. So the first one is, they had a pylon system. Apple would say something, then you would have these so-called transparency advocates come and say the same thing. Then you'd have the academics, Alan Clive Thomas, coming and say something, and then the Kite Show News makes it into a story. So the first thing is, you recall the whole campaign, we stole $110 billion. They had an ad running that ministers of the PVP are now worth $110 billion. But most importantly, Clive Thomas and Christopher um, Goldsoran wrote, and this has been repeated by APNU, that every year there is $28 billion of procurement fraud under the PPP. So it meant every time we tender, we are stealing $28 billion a year. I've been asking, they've been in office, since they're clean, very clean, you know, that sounds almost like Trump, very clean. <laughs> <laughs> they're very, very clean. <coughs> They must have saved the $28 billion that we were stealing per annum. So how, where is this reflected now? It should be reflected either in more civil works, but we're not seeing that. Or it should be reflected in lower budgeting, or budgetary expenditure. So they should have been budgeting $28 billion less to get the same benefit that we are getting. But you notice that has been swept under the carpet by all these civil society advocates who were saying it and by the APNU and the others. Nobody wants to answer that now. So I want you to ask the media that is here to ask Clive Thomas and Goldsoran that how much of the 28 and, and the Granger and Ramjatan how much of the $28 billion that they accuse the PPP of stealing through procurement fraud every single year that was so prominent in the past, how much of it is being saved and how? That's the first question they should ask. The second one is we heard that we were friends with vagabonds and that there was 15 up to last week it was repeated that every week we export, smuggled out of the country under the PPP, 15,000 ounces of gold. So this is a clean government, very clean. So one assume they're not smuggling anything out of the country. Zero, it has gone to zero. So what does that mean? 15,000 ounces multiplied by per week, multiplied by 52, gives you 780,000 ounces a year. At, at $1,200, that is about 9 point something, $9.3 billion. $936 million US dollars a year. If you have to get 5% of that, that's about $46 billion, a million, or $10 billion dollars in royalty. So they should have been collecting in royalty $10 billion more. $10 billion more. And the economy should have had an injection of close to a billion US dollars. In fact, 936 million US dollars. Where is this? Where is this? If they have stopped it. Or maybe they just continue the smuggling. But we were harassed, and up to two weeks ago, it's repeated glibly by the media. So that again, too, was a big issue that we were corrupt with. Now, I will, I will give you just a few snippets of what we are faced with. This is something that we did on challenges 
to the development of the Guyana Marian project. So let me tell you what was the media environment. And this was every single project that we started, we were faced with the same sort of thing. Whether it was the airport, the Hope Canal, the hospital. So in 2011, 14th of July, Kaichor News, that space money should not be used to fund Marion AFC. I'm not going to call the dates, I'm just going to read the 40 comments at 40 different times in the newspapers. AFC ICE, this is the 2nd of February 2012, AFC ICE Parliamentary Review of Plan Marriott Hotel. AFC even now more convinced that Marriott Hotel, Marriott Hotel not feasible and taxpayers could be ripped off. APNU will demand that Nissel be brought to books. They, these are all Kaichor, and uh, most of them are Kaichor and a few Stavro, right? Marriott Hotel, an inflated project and money laundering machine. Marriott CGIA project should be halted, including CGIA, <coughs> AFC, APNU. Um, clear as the government separating casino from hotel, APNU. AFC's position on Marriott a defense of special interests. Vote, House votes no more tax dollars for Marriott. Opposition passes motion to block funding for Marriott Hotel. And maybe I shouldn't read it. Forty comments, all negative. This is the environment that we had to practice development in. Every single day on fair headlines, Incessant, incessant set of lies being peddled by the major dailies and by their cronies in the, in the media houses, some of them. This is just an indicator of what we had to face with the, the hydro project and with the airport. Now, one would have assumed that since these things were so corrupt, money laundering scheme, the Marriott, that by now, 16 months later, this government would have found out who the money launderers are. Ramjatan spoke about people getting kickbacks. Who the money launderers were, where the money went. For Marriott now, it's almost like none of these things existed. None of this existed. And they're now saying we're going to go ahead with the project. They're having a good time at the Marriott. Very good time. And now they're going ahead to the second phase that we had said would be built on the PP because it's a profitable venture. And someone told me that they can get at least $10 million more for the Hope Hotel. $10 million more if they, if they do that. So that's, that's one, the Marian. What about the project they wanted to have? The airport project. We, they've just gone ahead. There was no need, they didn't even do an audit. I thought they would do an audit to find out who is the corrupt one, but, but let me tell you what really happened. That behind all of this talk about airport, etc., they have secretly done something. After they argued, we inflated the cost, and then said subsequently that we lowered the cost, they they have been redesigning the project. They've been redesigning the project. So the price remains the same, but the square footage of the project has decreased significantly. And the media will never press them to say, what's the square footage cost under the PPP, and what is it today? What is it today? But it's done secretly, and they've gone ahead with it. And the, and the hospital. The same evaluation, PPP evaluation that they said was corrupt, they then wanted to use the same evaluation to give the project to Ramdatan's client. Single source it to him, and the only reason they stopped that was because of the, the World Bank declaring the company corrupt. They talk a lot about uh, so I can go on and on about these things. 
we one by one, as I said before, we will take them part, apart on. They talk about friends and family, um, the friends and family thing. They, they broadcast legislation. Every time I open the paper, I see John Dale gave his friends and family this stuff. So let's look at it. I got a lot of friends and family. One, I'm racist, supposed to be racist. But they don't say that six of the ten licenses were given to non-Indians. So Maxwell Tom and Christie and Alfonso and Rudy Grant are suddenly my mems, friends and family members. All of them are my family members now. And I suspect they're focusing on, on Ramu. But Ramu did not get his license to us. <coughs> Started a newspaper on his own, bought Vera Telecommunications, so he got the television license to the purchase of Vera Station. Vera had a court case about a radio license. The court ruled in favor of Vera, and that's how he got his license. But you hear every single day, friends and family, and of course the PPP got license, and I don't mind that one. <laughs> so, that one, so I'm a politician, so they, they can accuse me of that one. But, but the thing is, this is it. You don't hear about that, friends and family thing. And we can talk about so many other things, Prado Vale and all of these places. We're going to talk later about them. So, I'm, today, this is just the beginning. I didn't come here to talk much about what they did. I want to talk about us, their accusations of us. You notice, I don't mention much about what they're doing now. And we have the moral, we have the moral authority, the moral right to do it. No matter what people like. Like the Kaishore News and some of these others. The, the hustlers. Anyhow, don't let me get into trouble. I've been saying, let me, I, they always accuse me of going off track and stuff like that. Today I'm nice. So, we do have the moral right. What, we said a lot of these things in the past. People didn't listen to us because of the environment. You know, people think the worst of you at that time because they had been fed on a diet of it. We will dismantle all of this. We'll show that the PPP changed Guyana for the good, for most people. We're not saying there wasn't corruption. We're not saying that. If you think we're saying that there was no corruption, we did have corruption, but we made institutional changes. We changed the framework. We never had the, these kinds of scan, scandals that they had. Imagine the settlement with DDL. And you know what is so bad about their acts? It is not so much the, the acts are are bad by themselves, but they seem to think that they don't have to account or give explanations to anyone. You know, so the DDL matter, imagine if we had settled a case that had implications of up to $80 billion for the Treasury. What people would have said to us? They would have come after us every single day. They would have accused us of corruption. They have done it. They couldn't find $1.7 billion to keep Wales open. Can't find $1.6 billion to keep paying the kids the 10,000 grand. Couldn't find $450 million to keep the old age pension subsidy, water subsidy, and electricity subsidy. But in a single settlement, exposes the treasury to $80 billion. That's the kind of thing. Or a BK settlement of a billion dollars, or a Rudisa settlement of two billion dollars, easily funneling, funneling out money like that. No, but they can't find resources there. They had to take away the jobs from the 2,000 Amerindian youngsters to finance this sort of thing. That's the approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jagdeo. As I had promised at the beginning of this conversation or discussion, that you will be fed a diet that will allow you clarity, 
will allow you awareness and will allow you an understanding of what we are faced with today as against what we faced with yesterday. I now open the floor, this part of the discourse belongs to you, where you get an opportunity to ask any of the panelists questions that are on your mind that may not have been answered in the discourse that took place in a little over an hour. has always been our ability to, to reach out in a way and, and, and to reach people basically and get the message out. So we have a lot of engagements on the ground. But if you go to a village and have a meeting, you, you meet a limited number of people and you can't do this often enough. So I ask people who are here, there are some media sources that are close to us. Try to, to subscribe to those, not necessarily pay, and you may be able to get more information. If you're online, it's the iNews. Then the party radio station. Um, we have the Guyana Times is op openly sympathetic to us. The Mirror. These are the, um, newspapers that will tend to carry our views more. And so at least you get an explanation from us on issues. You know our position. The, the other media houses, some of them have been open now because they're forced to do it. In the initial period, they almost had something that they would not talk about APNU corruption. Nobody has ever questioned the media, has not questioned the city council about the 800 million that they spent in cleaning up the city without a single tender. They have not asked how they collected their arrears. They're not pushing for the forensic audit of the city council. But you best, better, if it was the PVP, the same media houses will be running us down. So there's still that. And even when they write stories now, they always have a tendency to end it, it couldn't be as bad as under the PPP or as Jack Deal, but bad as Jack Deal. They always end that. This is their, their, they, they don't want to deal with the issues that are so blatant. Many of them are disappointed. So we have to find these media sources. We have to find ways of getting the message out. We suffered from it in government, and we will suffer from it again in if if we don't fix it you're absolutely right but i think people now are more open the other issues um it's approaches that the government has already made clear so i already spoke about the ddl matter i don't know if there is a secret deal um people keep saying to me that it's payback time for people who gave large donations before the elections so they were promised that when they get into government, they will settle cases in their favor. And they will settle them so massively in their favor that they would be able to, to recoup the money that they had invested in them and probably leave a, a bit more for other things, for corrupt practices. There is no, absolutely no way that you can justify the settlements that have been made. When I met the president, I said, we're gonna cooperate on the border issue that's above politics. The five other areas you suggested, let us hold those until you're finished with the witch hunting and with, and with your political. When you move beyond that, and you recognize that you have to run this country in favor of all of the people, then we'd be prepared to talk. But, but, I made an offer to him that on seven cases or so, we were prepared to share institutional knowledge. I said, Nandalal will talk to the Attorney General. I never took the advice. It was on the DDL matter. It was on the Rudisa matter. It was on the BK matter. It was on so many others. They did not want the advice because then we would have argued that we gave them the advice and they went against the advice and settled the claims. They did not want the advice, so that's why they killed it. 
And so there is a motive behind all of these settlements. And nobody goes after it. Look, have you seen any of the newspapers talk about the DDL issue? They just sweep it under the carpet, at least Kaichor or, or, or Stabro. They're not focusing. This is a, the massive, this has to be investigated. Our budget is $230 billion. And a settlement that can have $80 billion implication on the budget. That's unbelievable. Nowhere in the world would you have something like that. And yet, nobody pays attention to it. <coughs> and so, so yes, I, it could be linked to the, to the bridge. The owning land, we believe that every Ghanaian eventually should own a plot of land and build their own homes. We don't, if people want to live in high rises, that's fine. And, but the state resources have to be used in a manner that, you know, you're exec, they're in the executive now. They, they're in the country. They run, run the country. So they can choose to build apartment buildings if, if they want. Our vision is different. We, we, we have two different, completely different vision as to how this country will develop. Theirs has been characterized by a slew of taxes, including taxes on poor people, 140 taxes in the last budget. No focus on the productive sector. So there is no focus on wealth creation that will create the value and the jobs of the future. They believe that you can tighten up everything. You know, so, so people got to pay more. If you, if you bring in a barrel in the past, and yes, 10% of the people used to cheat on the barrel. They used to bring in electronic stuff and st things like that. But you don't need to penalize the 90% of poor people who families send a barrel by searching through every barrel and raising the taxes on the barrel. That's poor people. Or banning used tires. That's poor people again. Or prohibiting people from bringing vehicles or that, or that are over eight years old. They, they, ha, they, ha, they have not looked at who it impacts on. What about those pensioners who were getting a water subsidy all their life? And you know they're rewriting history. I saw this Valda Lawrence saying our target for old age pension was $20,000 and in just a short period we're just $1,800 away from it. That's not true. They said in the first 100 days, they will double old age pension. That's their lie. And if they were doubling it, it should be close to $30,000. That is the lie. They rewrite history all the time for, their, for promises that they're not fulfilling. So our approaches are fundamentally different. We want people to own things, to be able to invest, to get wealthier, to invest your money, own your own home, etc. We, if a man has a house lot now, even if he doesn't build, but you can demonstrate that this person is poor and he, he, he starts owning something, he owns it. If you go and take it away from him because he can't find the money to build, you condemn him forever into poverty. At least he has a piece of asset. Now you have 10% of the people who cheated, but you can't take away property from all of these poor people because of the 10% who cheated. Sometimes you, you have to go and do spot checks and, you know, find those people. So if you have another house somewhere in the city and you got a piece of land there, then we'll take it from you. But not the man who working as a carpenter or the guard or the waitress or the, the domestic servant and who scrape up her money or his money to buy a piece of land, can't afford to build yet, you're going to go after them, harass them, trudge them out in front of the ministry. They've got to sit down there. No conscience. No conscience for these people. It's bothering them a lot because this is their hope for a better life. And these people are snatching that away. Different philosophies about how you grow and change. Um, so I don't want to go on too long. I think I dealt with that. Did I miss something else? For oh, the airport, I think I dealt with it. There is something behind this. From you saying in this document that I just read, that you should have this project and that it was corrupt. 
to now changing the conditions of the project to favor the investor, the, the contractor. Something got to be wrong. What is wrong? You tell me. Because this government would tell no one. That's, that's the difference. Um, a mile of fall, again, that's why we ask for a fact-based uh, finding from the Norwegians. You know, we used to hear about FIP Motilal, that Jadeo gave FIP Motilal the contract. So that was the first thing for the road. We demonstrated, I said to them, you have the, the evaluation report for the road project. I've urged the government to make it public. Because if they make it public, then you will see that that uh, was the best bid. And it was not evaluated by Jack Dale, but by engineers and a financial person. And the recommendation made to us. But what they said, they can't release the report. Harman said they don't have it. And he's lying. Harman is lying. I said to him in Parliament, they have the report. They have all of these reports in a flash drive that Brassington gave them. I read out the contents of the flash drive to the cabinet subcommittee members. Some of them have not even read the documents. They don't re they're not even reading it. And they, and they block a project that can make such a big transformative impact on the country that would have brought in some 750 million US dollars in investment added two percentage point to GDP, reduce our cost of energy by 50%, because the cost in 2012 at the oil prices at that time was 20 cents per kilowatt hour, 10 cents. But, but all of this might be to support a corrupt act. So when Jordan said in Parliament, we're generating at 28 cents per kilowatt hour, he was lying, and we pointed this out. Jordan was lying. Can I get some water, please? He was lying because, because the real cost today is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. 10, 11 cents because oil prices have come down. But do you know that Patterson said a couple of weeks ago they are negotiating with Lloyd Singh for the wind power project. Now Lloyd Singh is the same man who built the the headquarter for AFC. So they're, they're telling us wait on the IDB energy mix study which has been submitted to them but long before the energy mix study has come out the Minister of Finance in the budget announces that we are now negotiating to buy wind power and we have pointed out the difference between wind power versus hydro and how that it, it can't be, it can't match, it can't become base load. Yeah, um, uh, any, anyone else? Yeah, please. I know we are All right. Well, that's a good one. Hopefully before. And um, the thing is that clearly if the things work the way they did, for, I think that's why it's so important that we have to separate what was real. And there was real corruption under the PVP too. You're going to see the headlines tomorrow. Jack Dale said real corruption under the PVP. You'll see that. So there was uh, Chabral, yeah. And, but 90% of it was perception driven by APNU, very effective, AFC, and by the sympathetic media. And they had an online following that was hostile. That was hostile, that just peddled this. Half of those people who were online and who were the conscience of the society and corruption are deeply ensconced now in the government. They are benefiting from acts of corruption on a daily basis, but they were the conscience of the society and the, mid the middle class, and they were online, they were pontificating about this. 
monstrous PPP being corrupt. So they're gone and hiding now or benefiting from them. These Imran Khans and what's the other one? Um, the Royal Johnson, all of them. They're gone on the underground and are benefiting from the largest of the government. And, and notice the David Hines too, who they're getting the money from the government now. They're working. So I saw Sam Hines write a wonderful letter outlining how we treated Linden because they've been pushing about the racism thing and we didn't treat Linden. And you know what he, his response was? Read Heinz's response. All generalities, a bit disparaging of the prime minister. And then he said, in the 90s, 1999, I think, the World Bank said youth unemployment in Linden was 40%. And he didn't say what it was in 1992. And then he said, there are other sources, not naming them, that said today it's 80%. What are the other sources? They thrive on, in an environment of propaganda. So Eric Phillips says afro guyanese own 3% of Guyana. But how has he come up with this figure? They said, we killed 400 young black men in when we were in office. That's what they said. When they made the first attempt to provide that figure, they, they don't say, we asked, who are, these, who are they? The first attempt they made, they included the policemen who were killed by the bandits in Buxton and the people who were killed by those bandits too. So ask them, who are the 400 names now? Because they like to peddle that. How did you calculate the 3% asset? And that's why the last time I was here, I said, let's do a comparative analysis, 1992 and 2015, about the state of afro guyanese If we go on facts, we will get rid of all of these people. They were not going to be so effective. They appeal to a visceral um, part of people. The gut, visceral. Their appeal is visceral. It's not to the head. But if we have the facts, the visceral appeal does not become effective anymore. And we need to educate people. We need to educate people. And once they're educated, we need to go to, to uh, Linden and to New Amsterdam and to Queenstown and to South Georgetown and challenge them in, the, in those communities to come up with the facts. And like the last time we were here and they talk about Georgetown, how we discriminated against Georgetown. Ras Saul came here. And when I outlined the changes in the city, what we took it, the starting point and where it is today, he, he had to acknowledge the changes we made because he was making it look like we neglected Georgetown when it's not so. We've transformed the city, not to clean up, but transform the city. And, uh, and, and it happened under the PP, but he was making it a racist thing that afro guyanese live mainly here. So these are some of the things we need to, to talk about, fact-based things. Um, I have two persons who asked to make a contribution, Rudolph Sicharan and Radi, and then um, Annette Arjun. Annette, yeah, let Annette go. Radi. Okay. Okay. Radi? Just examples. What is the PPP plus the civic? I've not seen too many civics. I hope there's an influx of civics, right ones. For example, you could bring in somebody like Dr. G. H. K. Lyle, you know, to help out. What is the PPP plus civic intending to do in the next few years to educate the 750,000 people in this country? about oil and gas production and the corruption associated with this industry. All right. Thank deal with um, the inevitable corruption that arises out of um, campaign funding. 
So I'm interested to know what you will do um, and what needs to be done, not only for your party, but any other party by the 20th um, onwards. And then secondly, um, when you mentioned about the Auditor uh, the General's report, while that was done, I think part of the challenge was the recommendation of the Auditor General not being followed through. And I think as well too that while well, as you said, um, that is like catch the night and um, Dr. Daniels admit there's corruption. I think as well too that there's also an integrity aspect where I won't say it deplorable, but when there was deplorable behavior too, it wasn't dealt with. So I think people like us who are my age with the two uh, and are looking forward and looking at the uh, you know, hearing what either party would be doing um, in, in the future. It's important that we get some clarity on that. And I know you said only one question, but also, uh, what are you doing to extend your base um, to, you know, persons outside of your traditional base as well? Thank you. Thank you. Again, approaches. And so we heard the first statement of a, a major nature coming from the government with Strutman saying, we intend to create a sovereign wealth fund. The People's Progressive Party has that in its manifesto. It campaigned on that promise to create a sovereign wealth fund. And so, so we intend to ensure that this happens. We intend to ensure this happens. Our primary task today is to, to criticize the government in a way that hopefully will raise the, the, the antenna of private citizens about the potential of abuse of these resources. Not in a way that, will, that is unhelpful. So the last time I said the tr about Trotman's statement, I said it was a very dangerous statement when he said, we intend to review the agreement, do a review. And I said, what does a review mean? Are you going to review it with a view of giving more benefits to ExxonMobil? Or are you going to review it to take more from ExxonMobil? Or are you going to review it to make the existing agreement more efficacious, effective, etc. But when a minister says that, we are very worried given what you have said about corruption and people being induced to sign bad agreements that have harmed the countries that they live in for, for a long while into the future. And so we are very worried about the government's approach to this. ExxonMobil and the others are huge companies. They have huge legal departments, maybe five, six hundred people and stuff like that working in those companies. They're massive companies. You have to ensure that you have the best experience at the table from any part of the world when you're interfacing with them. You have to come to the parliament and say, so people know what you're seeking in the review. This is not like any other sector. It's not about like a rice mill you're establishing in Borbies. This is huge with a multinational interest involved. So we are hoping that that will happen. We are going to also fight for a model of the sovereign wealth fund that is different than that of Trinidad and Tobago. Because the government on its own, the executive in those models, can create the conditions through fraudulent forecasting of revenue, etc., to access resources. In some other models, like in Norway, etc., there is a multi-stage process for accessing resources from a sovereign wealth fund. So you have to have independent verification that the conditions are met and the conditions must be real and objective, and then you have a parliamentary oversight. So the model that we will push for would be that. If we have such a model, and we have clean contracts and it's done transparently, oil can benefit the country 
in a way that doesn't destroy the other sectors like in many other parts of the world through the Dutch disease syndrome. And so we will pay close attention to, to that, but it's part of our plan. Um, campaign financing, the, the SARA bill. You notice the international community made some recommendations. So what they did with the SARA bill, they expanded this stuff to give Clive Thomas and the others supreme power. They would have even more powers, I think, than the president of Guyana, the person who had SARA. But they left out much any mention of campaign financing. We, once there is a proposal on the table for campaign financing, the PVP will seriously consider it. That is, that is our, our position on this. But we're not going to, but it's not part of the SARA bill. And it's um, because maybe, maybe it can be a separate bill. can be a separate bill. They're not so anxious to do that, but they're anxious in going after people, political opponents. They don't need anything now to go after political opponents that is not already in our laws. If people have assets illegally, they can charge them now. If they've stashed money abroad, I suggested we go to Interpol and ask for the bank accounts and the assets abroad held by former presidents, members of parliament, etc. It's easy. You can hire a firm to do that. You don't need all of this elaborate system, but they just want to use it for political purposes. But we would seriously consider anything on campaign financing. The recommendation of the audit report, yes, there are many transgressions because you, you, many transgressions were identified even when the Treasury Memorandum was issued as to how they should be fixed. Many of the accounting officers did not fix them. So that happened under the PVP. But a lot of these were administrative type of transgressions at the level of the, the sub-treasury, the accounting officer, not at the cabinet level, not at the politician level. A lot of it was at those levels. You know, the abuse of somebody stealing the gasoline and they didn't write up the bills and stuff. A lot of that in the Audit General Report. You know, the driver keeping the vehicle out, lots of those things. And maybe we are not tough enough on, on them. But let me tell you other recommendations. For example, the reconciling of these accounts that they talk about, that billions of dollars are left in accounts at the central bank that the PPP never reconciled. The reason we couldn't for many, many years, we did some and where we could find documents. But you cannot close accounts unless they reconcile because we are very worried about that, closing accounts with some. And the problem is that many of these accounts, most of them were from the pre-1992 era. There's no supporting evidence, document, you know, like for the Auditor General to assess in closing these accounts. Now contrast that, they're there now, so you can close the accounts and say, forget about them. But if you had, you're following some accounting practices, you should reconcile before closure. And most of these accounts were pre-1992. You notice they're here. Not that we stole the money from these accounts, but we didn't close them. The other accounts that they said we stole from, the Forestry Commission, GGMC, their Housing Fund, NFMU, the lotto, you notice big things. These were slush funds for the PPP. They've done audits on all these. What they've found is $30 billion sitting in there. Not anybody stealing no money. They said they will transfer the money immediately. Nandalal spoke to you about the experience. Why doesn't the media urge them to do that? Suddenly they found it efficacious to keep the money outside. It's good macroeconomic practice to keep it there. So if it's good macroeconomic practice now, why wasn't it good macroeconomic practice in the past? Because it is, you know, it, it adds to money supply, makes money looser, etc. Uh, monetary policy. So why was it that when it was kept outside, it was for the PPP to steal, which they have no evidence of. They have had 16 months and now found 
a single thing wrong with those accounts that have $30 billion in them. So that's it. When you go through the audit report, you will see a lot of, a lot of those transgressions. And the transgressions take place at different levels in the government. Um, those are two, what else? Huh? A tradition. The thing is that we, it's no secret that the PP has had predominantly its support from, from Indo Guyanese and Amerindian. And I think the, the main thing <coughs> is that the racism, they accuse us of, of racism. Mm -hmm. But if you examine, that's why I would like a fact based examination of their policies. We have to do much more in terms of talking to people, getting them to understand, getting them to listen in these communities. The same block that many of you have about the PPP, many people in these communities have about us. Because they've been conditioned to think that this is a Kuliman party. That's what they've been told actively through the Whisper campaigns. The Kuli People Party, and it's corrupt. And so they have a mental block to much of what you say. It's a, oh, that's just an excuse. We have to get past that shield, as we're trying to do here, because so many people just didn't listen to us, even people who supported us. And so you have to get past that shield and fight the stereotype in the communities, because so that when the racist or the, the inimical to the PPP messages are carried in those communities that people would say, hold on a minute, I've heard a different explanation. I don't like the people or I like them, but why don't we contrast the two and, wait and see which one makes sense? And I think so it, harder work in those communities, going out, meeting with people, talking, in spite of their instigation to create hostility. So when I went to the vendors, they, didn't, they hated the message. They didn't want us to talk to, the, to people because they don't want the message, the alternate message to get to people because they're afraid of that message and what the party has stand, stood for all these years. Because regardless of what, we, we've never promoted institutionalized racism, even if there were acts of racism under the PVP. We never promoted institutional racism. And this is what they're doing now. Institutionalizing racism. Institutionalizing it. We never did that. With all of our faults. And our party from Chedi Jagan days have been open to people of every religion and every race. And we will remain so. So those are the two. Um, I have, yes. You have a lot of things here about the forensic audits, etc. I got to, some stuff. But the forensic are, are audit, yeah, we, that's a jailing thing. You remember they said they would jail all of us? The usual thing, that the forensic audits were supposed to be for, to jail us. And so we're saying you have done the audits now. It's time for you to charge people or move on. It's either you charge people and don't make frivolous excuses. You charge them if you found anything corrupt because that's the purpose of a forensic audit. Charge him, let's go to the, the court. I must say that all of you, tomorrow we will not be listening to the president when he addresses the National Assembly. We will go to the parliament. We will debate the item, the motion, on the agenda, the order paper, on youth policy, but we will not listen to him. We need to send a signal to this country, PPP supporters as well as ordinary people, that we will not allow the hauling out of our democracy. Because if we don't stop the initial steps, they're going to grow into an avalanche of activities aimed at denying us our rights. 
And so who is safe in Guyana? If a person who has constitutional protection, who, has, who is protected in, the, in his functioning, in the position he holds, by some entrenched clauses in our constitution, if he cannot be protected, when they come, as I said before, once, when they come after the, the guy who, who has the core home, the poor man, the, the woman on the street, the vendor, and the, and, and the waitress, when she has to go and face the brunt of the government, who is going to protect her if, if they can't respect constitutional offices? And so what we have here is a total abuse of the executive power. The president, in this case, they called this man over, Carvel Duncan, and said to him, you leave the job, resign, and you will get a financial package. Harmon said that to him. Then the president said to him and said, I don't want blood on the carpet. What does that mean? Now this is the president, a holder of a constitutional office, talking to another person who's protected in his functioning by the constitution. And he is told, you take a package, you resign, because I don't want blood on the carpet. The court case that you have there now, they're accusing, you know what they're accusing Carvel Duncan of? Stealing $100 a month, US dollars. That is his transgression. Stealing 100 US dollars a month in director's fees. That's the allegation. The case is ongoing. Government appoints this tribunal. Contrary, you've heard the explanation. Contrary to natural justice and our laws and our constitution. The right to a fair hearing. Court had not ruled as yet. And then, today, that hearing has not been completed by the tribunal. Then suspends Carvel Duncan from his post. You then come tomorrow to the parliament, which is the place where our laws are born, the place where our democracy is protected, and then lecture us on good governance. Dave <laughs> Carvel just walked in her school. You, it will be a dereliction of our duty as MPs to sit and listen to another lecture on good governance when the president, the executive, cannot respect the holder of a constitutional post and give him a fair hearing in this country. Our worry is not just about Carvel Duncan. It's when they come for you, the ordinary people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Um, apart from him, is there any other persons who would like to ask a question? Please put your hands up so I can identify you. All right, please go ahead. Madam Moderator, you observed that uh, any government uh, that is corrupt uh, poses a threat to uh, democracy. And uh, Mr. Bishop, I believe you uh, noted that the practices of the current government uh, are corrupt and suggested also that in its very essence and nature, it is also corrupt. If that is the case, then not only principles are corrupt, sorry, not only practices are corrupt, but principles and the very essence of that government is corrupt. That part makes it much more insidious than 
the practice of Quran. What is the opposition intended to do as far as advancing uh, evidence of, of corruption? What mechanism uh, does it expect to put in place that would hold the current government responsible for these practices of corruption? Thank you. I think the first place that we have to make our fight public, and we have been doing that, is at the Parliament. And you would have noticed that we would have taken to the Parliament motion after motion to be debated so that the voices of the people could be properly heard and issues could be ventilated. What we have taken place is that oftentimes when we send our motions to the parliament, the speaker spends a considerable amount of time cogitating over it before he makes a determination. It takes forever to get to the order paper. Even when it gets to the order paper and it's an opposition day, they want to change the agenda of the opposition day so that it is never heard. And when it is debated and heard, rather than listening to the views, they use their one-seat majority to degut the intent of the motion, to switch it and to adjust it, and to make it of no effect. So we have to continue there in the parliament, but forums like these, and using the media, both social media, and regular media to educate the masses, we have to be able to do that. And coming on the back of what Leader of the Opposition just said about the, the, the attack on a, a constitutional office holder, if they could do that to somebody big, could you imagine what happens to somebody who they don't want in a particular place? We have a situation with the Tom Clark in um, Linden where a man who's not even authorized to sign a letter to Senator and Leaf, Senator and Leaf, and the minister refuses to even speak to the issue. So what, what will happen if they, you are perceived to be PPP? And finally, since I have the podium, I have a suspicion, having lived in Guyana for 50 years, and that's my age, just over 50, This effect of the crassness of the move against Carville Duncan, it's not just about him being chairman of the Public Service Commission. It's about him being a black man that is supposedly a supporter in their eyes of the PPP. And it's a way of teaching black people a lesson. You support the PPP, this is what we will do with you. And I say that tonight unapologetically. I'm convinced about that. And if any of the black activists wants to take up a debate on this, then they have to show that they have moral standing. Why were they silent when the tribunal was established and the court case is still ongoing. They've lost their moral standing to speak to this issue when they did not say, Mr. President, you're going too far. Let the court case finish. We were the black activists. But Carville Duncan is the sacrificial lamb for a public display. It could be a Net. It could be some other black person who they figure you have deserted the tribe. And that is where the racism exists in Guyana. Not in the PPP. That is where the racism exists. There's also another angle because of what Carville, Carville prevents them from doing. Because his presence there means that they can pursue this agenda. And the agenda is to remove people and to replace those people with supporters 
of the up, up no whether they are qualified or not, as we have seen. So he serves as a block to, to their agenda, the implementation of their agenda. And that's why they're doing it. And the, and the agenda doesn't bode well for the country. You saw the case where the public service, um, what do they call it? The public service college, staff college. Staff college. You know, no public advertisement to recruit people. How could you end up where every single staff member is of one race? How could you do that? Where there is no public advertisement. It meant people were handpicked and placed there. And they want to do the same thing, but he stands in, in the way in, and in other places. And, and so it is, it is. And it's not ordinary black who will benefit from this. A few nights ago, we had cause to explore this, that people who live in Queenstown or in Region 5, now, the black farmers who are struggling in the rice industry, they have just seen their rental rates for land gone up. They have been told that you're in a sector that the government will not give you any help in. So they will suffer too. So it is for, as it was on the Burnham, it was for an elite. Those who can pontificate don't create value, the Heinz and the, and the Phillips and the others and the Clive Thomases and, the, and those are the others. Not ordinary afro guyanese who live and today are struggling across the country like everyone else. Not them. Those are the taxi drivers and, and the shopkeepers and the, the girls who are, who are the sales girls and everybody else. Or the vendors. Not for them. Not for them. Although they may have the right race, but it, it doesn't matter. They're not elite, so they're not going to benefit. And so we have to analyze that carefully. Speak, Daniel, speak. Um. Just to add one thing to um, the gentleman's question is that the PVP has always, they did, they are doing, and they will continue to do, that is to educate, create awareness, and expose all forms of discrimination, victimization, corruption as it see it. And that means going throughout the length and breadth of Guyana and to create that awareness. I, um, Comrade Anil would like to add uh, something to the discussion here. I, I just want to add uh, to the question asked by the gentleman, is that outside and apart from the avenues outlined, we are also challenging these matters in the court. Carville matter, we filed an action today in which we are seeking to stop the tribunal from proceeding with its work. The bond issue, we have filed an action against that. This lady, her house was taken away. Her sister, look, look at this, look at this person. Single woman, her sister, almost looked like her, and her home, a core home given to her as a single mother under an IDB funded project with the government of Guyana, and this government took it away. Took it away though she has transport. Call her into the Ministry of the Presidency. She's uneducated, asks to see the documents of title for the place, and takes it. And then goes and put a sign on the house that it is the property of the Ministry of Housing. And that has happened in dozens of instances Kanji, Parfit Harmony, Tushin, Enterprise, Block CC, Monrepo, right across the coast. We are challenging them all. The opposition leader spoke about the Region 5 farmers. Their leases, their leases for rice lands at MMA, taken from them simply because they were given by President Ramadar. Afro Guyanese, villages of Seafield and number four, village on the west coast, probably, the, the, the lease is just taken away from them. 
we have those matters and given to PNC activists, party card members, party card holders. That is what qualified them for the lease. We have all those matters in the court. And we will continue to put these matters in the court. So, and also we are preparing documents, institutional racism that we are speaking about, the 1,972 Amerindians, and dozens of people who have been dismissed from the public sector, indo guyanese and afro guyanese because of their political persuasion or perceived political persuasion. And we are compiling statistics that we will display internationally and send to international organizations to sensitize them and apprise them of the level of discrimination and witch hunting that is taking place in Guyana. So we are doing a lot. We are doing a lot. And thankfully, we have the Caribbean Court of Justice. And we can hopefully go there if the system becomes contaminated. Because, you know, the system of the dictatorship, they contaminate the judiciary. And that's why Barnum flew the flag of the PNC in the Court of Appeal compound. So we can be unmindful of these facts. These are our history. And we have to be uh, vigilant that these things don't happen again. Comrades, on behalf of the People's Progressive Party, I would like to thank all of you here this afternoon. Without your presence, this discussion This afternoon I would like to close because I saw a television news cast and uh, I saw this gentleman and I'm sure you're Mr. Coachman. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. I saw the news uh, that he came back, he's a Guyanese, he lived overseas for a while, he came back and he walked from Georgetown right on to let them into him. But those of you who would have traveled Guyana would know Guyana is an extremely, extremely beautiful country. Uh, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And that's a good job for us to end this evening's proceedings. Thank you, thank you, thank you.